one day Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? Amen. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready. יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome to the NTEB House Church Sunday service. We're very glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. And if you're listening to this program in the archives, uh, we're glad that you have a, a church to attend. And we're doubly pleased that you're also listening to this program. Today, <laughs> I would like to talk to you about something that could not possibly be more timely or more important. My message today is, if you're more concerned about Omicron than the judgment seat of Christ, your priorities are out of line. The headlines this weekend are screaming out nuggets like, Omicron grips nation, USA fear 1 million cases per day, as the latest variant of the Wuhan produced and Fauci funded COVID virus Omicron settles in right before Christmas. No surprise there. Truth be told, I have had a number of friends die from COVID over the past 21 months. So it's certainly not something to dismiss or take lightly. But what sayeth the scripture? I'm glad you asked. Luke chapter 20, verse 38, my text for today. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living. For all live unto him. Would it surprise you to learn that many of the writers of the Bible wrote about being fearless for the Lord, even though when they live that out, it cost them their life? Absolutely. Jeremiah was a fearless prophet for the Lord, and he was rewarded by being killed for the words that he spoke. Same goes for just about all of the prophets up to and, and including John the Baptist, who was perhaps the boldest of them all. Jesus said about his cousin John that of, of, of all uh, men born among women, there is none greater than John the Baptist in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. But John's boldness, as inspiring as it is to read, led to his ultimate execution. Same thing happened to Peter, James, John, uh, not John, Paul, <laughs> and most of the others in the New Testament. What does all this have to do with Omicron? Well, plenty. You and I are here on a 24-hour pass. When we close our eyes at night, there is no guarantee that we will live to see the sunrise for whatever reason. In fact, the Bible says that if you're saved, you are already reckoned to be dead but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Your greatest concern is not Omicron, but the judgment seat of Christ, the unbreakable appointment of every born-again child of God. Today, I would like to help you and me to get ready for our upcoming unbreakable appointment. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we look to you as the source of everything. Your word says that every good and perfect gift cometh down from, from the Father of lights in heaven. 
And today, God, we don't look down. We look up. We look away from the headlines today. And we look to what the Bible says is our unbreakable appointment. And and it is our fervent desire this morning, Lord, to dump all the junk and get ourselves ready for that appointment, to get ourselves ready for that day. And Lord, uh, I ask you to give me the words today to speak. I believe that you've already laid that on my heart, Lord, but I don't take any of that for granted. Lord, give me the words to speak. Your word says, Lord, about that day, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And Lord, we ask this morning that you would indeed prepare us for that day. The Apostle Paul says that there is terror attached to the judgment seat of Christ. How can that be? When I hear so many other people preaching on um, that the judgment seat of Christ is just a happy, joyous experience where crowns are given out like candy. But that's not what your word says, Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, Wherefore we labor, that's working, that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of... Why don't people preach on that? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So, Lord, we come before you this morning and we ask you, Lord, to give us a vision of the judgment seat of Christ today. Lord, give me the ability, speak through me, let me make it clear, let me make it plain, let me be, let me make it something that a six year old child could grasp if they were listening, or a hundred year old senior citizen and everybody in between. Lord, it's not complicated. It is simple. And it's our Hebrews 9.27 unbreakable appointment. So we come before you today, Lord, and we commit this time to you. And as um, the United States prepares for Omicron and the president is preparing to address the nation and Uh, We look out across the world and we see fear gripping Germany and the UK and Spain and Israel and the Middle East and China and Africa. And we see the whole world with our eyes on Omicron. Lord, let us take our eyes off of the temporal, the temporary. And Lord, for just a little while this morning, get our eyes fixed on you and give us a vision of the judgment seat of Christ, Lord, our unbreakable appointment. And we commit this time to you, Father God, and we ask you to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Glad that you're here today. Today is December 19th, 2021. And uh, as I said, Uh, fear has gripped the world yet again. (laughs) But if you're a regular listener to our Prophecy News podcast, we told you this was coming, I don't know what, 16 months ago, 14 months ago. If you're a regular listener to this program, you know that uh, we've been warning you for quite some time that they're not going to run out of variants to release. (laughs) And um, that has turned out to be very true. Alpha, Delta, Omicron. And yet, today we're going to put our eyes not on Alpha, Delta, Omicron, or whichever one comes after that. We're going to take our eyes off of um, 
Delta and Omicron. And we're going to put our eyes on the Alpha and Omega. Jesus Christ says about himself, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And today I want to give you a vision for the judgment seat of Christ. Glad you're here with us this morning. The singers are tired The church as we know it Is losing its fire And some are discouraged From bearing the load But we must determine To keep pressing on Cause it's just one more soul Were to walk down the aisle Yes, it is. Lifetime of labor. That's right. It's still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. So preachers keep preaching. Gotta get and ready, singers people. Singers go sing. This is and no joke. Keep sharing. This is no game. This is your life. Is king. The angel. But your life is not determined here, it's determined there. The throne, and they'll start rejoicing for just one more soul. And if you're saved today, you need to get a vision of the judgment seat of Christ. right it's worth it all that's why we do this that's why we do what we do for just one more soul is it worth it to you The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7, the Apostle Paul tells us, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ." And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means... I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul lays lays the whole thing out clear and plain. This is to be the desire of every Christian. 
the Apostle Paul, from an earthly perspective, he lost a lot. He lost his standing. He lost his reputation. He lost his association with the rich and powerful people of the temple system. He lost his money. He lost just about everything. And what did the Apostle Paul get in exchange for everything that he lost? Well, the first thing that happened is he got knocked off his horse. <laughs> Second thing that happened was he, um, he became blind for a season, the Bible says. The third thing that happened is he became an apostle. Paul says that he is a, um, in First Timothy, that he, he, he was an apostle by the commandment of God. And then, of course, he goes on to talk about being shipwrecked in a day and night in the deeps and being stoned and being whipped and um, uh, uh, homeless and hungry and all these different things. And then when the Apostle Paul gets to the end of his life, we read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, For I am now ready to be offered. Paul knew that his time was at hand. He says so. He says, And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. That that's the unbreakable appointment for us. And Paul is talking about it here in 2 Timothy 4, 8, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day the judgment seat of Christ, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Today, I want to talk to you, if you're just tuning in today, I want to talk to you for just a few moments about the judgment seat of Christ in light of Omicron, in light of the fear that has gripped this world for the last 21 months. And I want us to get our eyes off of Omicron and all the other variants that are stacked up like planes on a runway to come in after Omicron and I want us to get our eyes on what Satan is trying to distract you from. Satan wants you to focus on Omicron, but the Bible wants you to focus on the judgment seat of Christ. And today, Lord willing, I want to talk to you about your unbreakable appointment. Glad you're with us today. word is true from the beginning, and every one of my righteous judgments endures forever. I believe that. I believe the word of God is true from the beginning. Genesis 1. Now I've got thinking to myself, I wonder what if a fellow got down hell and he could write back about it. I wonder what he'd say. I wonder what he'd say. So, did you guys go see Santa tonight? Yep. Yeah? What did you ask Santa for? The Easter Bunny. Are we there yet? No, not quite yet. It's going to be a little bit longer. Does your preacher preach two best from hell every year? If he doesn't, he's not following the example of Jesus Christ. I want you in heaven. I want you in New Jerusalem. Don't want you in the lake of fire. The God of that Bible is holy. He'll let you go to hell. If you want to go, you can go. Don't go. 
You don't have to go. You don't have to go. Don't go. The way to know is to trust Christ your Savior, believe on Him as your Savior, and trust what He did dying on Calvary's cross to take away your sins. If you don't believe that, why don't you try it? If you don't have assurance of eternal life, why don't you try that instead of what you're trying? Some of you folks I've talked to have been trying other things for years, haven't you? And you still don't know. You can know now. You say, well, I got to be Ruckman. You've got to receive Jesus Christ, your Savior. Just when you get saved, it's not just getting something for nothing. It's getting everything for nothing. See, that's what the thing is. Whatever you do, don't go to hell. You folks here with gray hair and white hair, whatever you do, whatever you say, whatever it's going to be, there's one thing I'm going to ask you. Don't go to hell. You'll get in there, you'll never get out. Hell is no joke. God doesn't want you there. Christ doesn't want you there. The people in hell don't want you there. The people that love you don't want you there. The question comes up, who is it that wants you in hell? I'll make it as simple as I can. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. That's all there is to it. It's so simple. Men make it so hard. Preachers make it so difficult. I don't know why. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. Can I get any more plain with you? You want to go to hell? Trust something else. Hi, Dad. Hey, see, hey, see what's that? Way down there at the edge of that street, there's the Lord up there in glory. And down he comes off that throne. He always would come down for a sitter. <laughs> and he comes down there. Well done, thou good and faithful servant of the joy of our Lord. going to get started with your prayers and praise, so please post them in the chat room. When man sinned in the garden, that sin Jehovah could not condone. The blood shed of animals could not Forever sin atone, but the Son had compassion. He said, Father. It's been three days since heaven Watch their prince of glory die His followers are in mourning For in the tomb their Savior lies But as
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yes, sir. That precious blood. Amen. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and uh, God, we're glad to be alive today. But your word tells us that we are to be dead unto sin and reckon ourselves alive unto God through Jesus Christ. And uh, Lord, we ask you, Lord, Father God, to cleanse us today, wash us of our sin, and um, give us a heavenly vision today. Give us a, a holy unction today. Give us a, a, a burden and a passion for lost souls. Give us a burden and a passion to put your word into the hands of people who need it, and that's everybody. Give us a passion and a burden to warn the lost and to remind the saints. Lord, we pray for lost souls this morning like Sarah and Eric and Becky Jacobs, Greg and Melissa Price, Glenn Clark, Jeanette's granddaughters, Cheyenne, Bridget, and Tony, and nephew Matthew, Trevor, Derek, Adam, Jordan. I pray for, we pray for my three brothers, John, Jimmy, and David. Jesse for salvation. Ralph, Rachel's dad. Salvation for the Bolton family. Salvation for Colby Bohan. Salvation for Jordan Long and David Peck. Susan Weir's Bicky is praying for her daughter's Valerie and Marie and her son and husband, both named Greg. Kentucky Jeffrey uh, is praying for salvation for Tyler and Tevin, daughter-in-law Caitlin, and grandsons Logan, Ronnie, and Russell. Jay and Bob from Wisconsin asking prayers for unsaved Catholic family members. Danielle for salvation. Connie's three unsaved children. Joshua Gaskins and wife April praying for Stephanie and Michael. Tulip, a middle-aged Roma gypsy from Turkey, praying for her entire family. Brandy, asking prayers for family salvation. Rita in Colorado, praying for Dan's salvation. Ron for salvation. Spray of Sunshine, praying for Daniel, Patrick, and Brian, her uh, sons. Shannon is praying for Lori W. and Brian M. Patrick needs to be saved. Rick Dotson needs to be saved. Ron needs to be saved. Pete and his daughter, Allie, need to be saved. Jan Lacker is praying for son, David. Barbara is praying for Robert, Naomi, Blake, Alex, Ethan, Raquel, Janet, and Shondell. Nicole Zimmer, prayers for salvation for my best friend and her family, the Meads and the Cooks. Cheyenne, praying for salvation for uh, Barry, Terry, Alan, Melody, Nick, Rick, and Beth. Karen is praying for children Jason and Tiffany and grandchildren Summer, Austin, and Emmett. Barbara, salvation for son Jody. Jerry Ann Nicholson, John Henry gave me an update the other day. She's getting better. We reported to you that her and her husband were in the hospital with COVID pneumonia on a ventilator. And the Lord took her husband Dan home last week. And Jerry seems to be improving, so we're going to continue to pray for Jerry Ann Nicholson. Jennifer Thompson, 
Uh, we're praying for her fiance who had a stroke to get better. Mark Sherlock, salvation for four-year-old Savannah and her mom, Stephanie. Samantha, friend Marcia in the hospital with COVID. And we're praying for her healing as well as her salvation. Danny Arenas, prayers for his dad who is hospitalized with COVID. We have people battling cancer. Clayton Perry, Sammy in South Africa, Harmon's son Michael, Becky Markovich, Jerry Rogalski, Kara Marsh. Uh, we are praying um, for my friend Denise, who is getting the results of a biopsy tomorrow. And uh, um, she asked us to pray for a good result with the biopsy. Same with Kara Marsh. And um, if, if, if we could get an update on Kara, that would be great. Um, Hal needs a lung transplant. Clayton Perry is recovering from stem cell transplant um, operation for his cancer. And his wife, Kathy Perry, had shoulder replacement surgery the other day. And uh, it all went well. And she thanks uh, all of us for uh, our prayers for her as she recovers. Dana's husband needs prayer with a medical issue. Anna Gutierrez, um, prayers for conceiving a healthy baby. Suzanne Smith, severe back pain from an injury. Uh, we're praying for Jackie Har um, Heyman, uh, who, who is going to court over a custody issue with her son. And we just pray that the Lord would rule and overrule in that situation. Jeanette is home from the hospital. She's in the chat room today. Um, she still needs lots of prayers. She still needs your support. And um, if the Lord puts on your heart to donate to her GoFundMe for her medical expenses, please do so. Please pray about that. I've always believed that um, uh, God takes care of his children through God's people. And um, so if you haven't donated to her GoFundMe, please pray about doing so. Uh, Elizabeth and family on spoken prayers. Lots of people with unspoken prayers. Chelsea on the West Coast. Lori D in Pennsylvania. Uh, Lori Ann in Maine. Uh, Janet with an unspoken. Please remember our overseas pastors. Pastors John Reed, Danny and Arnell in the Philippines. Fo John in Vietnam. Uh, Lou Ann in Turkey. And um, Pastor John Ree from the Philippines said, please pray for our successful Thanksgiving celebration. And uh, they are having a Thanksgiving Day and child dedication at the Nehemiah Bible Believing Baptist Church. And uh, most of you know that um, Pastor John Ree is one of the churches that we support um, with Bibles, with gospel tracts, and financially. So uh, please. Uh, he's asking for prayers for his church service. Um, please remember our NTEB street preachers, Jeffrey in Ohio, Kyle in Baton Rouge, Joshua in Virginia. Up in Canada, we have a growing list. Werner Bukes, Paul and Peggy Caulfield, Adrian Breda, Greg Scott, and Jeffrey Sapasinik up in Toronto, Ontario, and Vancouver. In Australia, we have Henry Biggs and Jennifer Thompson. We have uh, Arthur in South Africa. And uh, we have Marie in Philadelphia. Please keep her in your prayers um, because uh, she works for the Salvation Army and she's being told she's got to get jabbed or she's got to quit. And um, she is asking for prayers simply for the Lord's will. She's not afraid at all. She's bold. She's fearless. Exactly what you would expect from a street preacher. Lisa C.W. Healed from COVID. She thanks us for our prayers. And her daughter Tina is also healing from COVID. Rhonda says, good morning. Please put my family on the prayer list. My mother passed away 12-15. And my dad is in the process of transitioning to heaven. He is in the end stages of life. Cheryl H., 
prays that my husband and friend Steve made it cross country with two large trucks and three dogs. I pick him up at 11 p.m. tonight. Thanks for all of you who prayed concerning this and for Steve's salvation. Praise God. Amen. Gia Camino, my cousin Mike in Virginia, fully jabbed, had a stroke, fell, and hit his head in very bad shape. And uh, it's highly likely that that stroke was because of the jab. Please pray for him and his family. Shannon is asking for prayers for me and for the hall ministry. That's me and Lorianne and Jeanette and Harmon and the people who work at the bookstore, uh, Megan, Miranda, and Haley, and the people who work at Mudflower Creative, Dara and Megan, and um, the entire team is growing. And uh, Shannon is asking for prayers for all of us, uh, um, for strength and comfort and a worshipful spirit during these strange and evil times. Amen. Melissa, please pray for my husband's VA situation. That's the Veterans Administration. Shauna, um, this is a, a tough one. Good morning, family. Prayer and praise re- request, please. My mom went on to glory on twelve fifteen from COVID pneumonia, and my dad will join her so very soon from stage four cancer. Prayer for comfort. Praise report. My alcoholic atheist brother, <laughs> that's pretty good, accepted Jesus Christ as his savior. Amen. And my mom was able to know that her prayer was answered before she went home. Shauna says, I love you all so very much. Jeanette says, please pray that I can find caregivers to fill the empty spots. Thank you all for your prayers and support. Ron Wooter said, prayers please for Griffin Voorhees, the son of my lifelong friend Steve, Christians all. Griffin has COVID and is in the ICU. Aunt Nancy says, we have listeners here this morning that are confused about how to be saved. So please pray that their eyes will be opened. And amen. Thank you for telling me that. And I I will address that directly. His grace says, please pray for my neighbors on either side of our home. They don't get it. Holy Spirit, move them in. The seed is planted. Amen. Uh, Julia, prayers for my mother with a leaky heart valve. D.S. Pan, prayers for Bishop Bawa and his Emmanuel Chapel ministry in Zimbabwe, Africa. I love that this ministry reaches as far away as Africa. That makes me happy. We have listeners in over 130 different countries. And I love when they reach out and let us know that they're listening. And yes, we will absolutely be praying for Bishop Bawa. Uh, and the Emmanuel Chapel Ministry in Zimbabwe. Mary says, please pray for my Air Force son going to D.C. My mom, who's in a nursing home, not doing well. My sister Joanne has blood clots and my brother John. Hannert's 13, prayers for my husband and I. I've been struggling bad since September. Amen. Jimmy, praying for salvation for Mary and Michael Lewis, Carl, salvation for all the Roman Catholics at my work and my friend Raylord, Chrissy, pray for the lost people like Penn Gillette. And uh, he's part of that magic team, Penn and Teller, that was popular during the 90s. And Chrissy says, uh, pray for the lost like Penn Gillette. We heard him bragging how when he was a kid, He was led from a youth group to atheism. Christian Believer says, pray that I get this upcoming job. Annabal says, pray for me and my wife, Vilma, for boldness to give gospel tracts and to spread the gospel. Tashina, praying for salvation for my high school friends, 
Paul, Chris, and Reed. Paul, Chris, and Reed. I think that's three, not two. Um, that she is meeting on Monday. Jean is asking for prayers for a transgender stepson. Amen. And uh, I would direct you to um, uh, read our article about Laura Perry, who is a great friend of this ministry, and how she went from transgender to transformed. Uh, you might want to go to BibleBeliever.com and pick up a copy of that book and give it to your son, written by a, a woman who came out of the transgender lifestyle. It's called From Transgender to Transformed. Uh, Joshua Gaskins, praise report, family member Jeremy in New Orleans was suddenly hospitalized and became unconscious and put on a ventilator. And in about a week's time, he's returning back to normal and gaining strength. Praise, Please pray for his salvation. Praise God. Amen. Ron Wooter, I just received this update from Steve. I spoke with a nurse this morning. Griff had a fever and a spiked heart rate. He is intubated. She stated that she has him comfortable. He is medically paralyzed. Um, They are monitoring him extremely closely, and the nurses have been great. I've shared with the team that we have a host of people sending prayers daily, not just for him, but for the team also. Thank you all for your prayers and support. Um, Kindly continue to pray for Griffin, Ashlyn, Logan, and Sampson. God is able, and I'm begging for his uh, mercy on Griffin. Remember us, Lord. We have nothing more to give. Amen. We come with empty hands when we come before the Lord. We owe a debt. We have nothing to give. We need it all from the Lord. Heavenly Father, for all these prayers and for the unspoken prayers of our hearts, we ask you to be merciful today. We ask you to be merciful with us. For all the people who were hospitalized and dealing with shoulder replacement surgery and battling cancer and battling COVID, people like Jerry on respirators and ventilators, Lord, we ask you to work and move And do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. And Father God, there's a great many people listening this morning. And we pray, Lord, that if there's one here who is lost, and Aunt Nancy says that there are, we pray that something would be said and done to lead a lost soul to Jesus Christ. And for those of us that are saved, Lord, please remind us how precious the time is. Precious meaning scarce, (laughs) short, and um, we just come before you, Lord, with, with, with open hearts and empty hands, with our heads bowed on our knees, and saying, be merciful to us, Father God, and give us something from your word that will help us. And we commit this time to you, Lord, and ask you to hear all these prayers and answer them for your glory and for our good. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome, everybody. Glad that you're here today. I want to read to you a Christmas card that was sent to me by um, Leanna from Oregon. And she writes, Dear Pastor Greider, Merry Christmas. I look at your website every day, and it's a great blessing to have some fellowship with like-minded brethren there. I don't need to preach to you about the advancement of end times events. Amen. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Now we know that the rapture is coming, but even now, many are suffering as a result of the vax mandates, and we know that it will only get worse. So while we are still here, I'm writing everyone on my list to see who would be interested in a ministry to help those of us who find ourselves with a new yellow star. She's talking about being unvaccinated. I I would like to set up a support and safety network, an underground railroad. She writes, I have contacts all over the country. Let me know if this would be something you would be interested in by replying. 
And she closes her letter, Matthew 25, 31 through 40. So turn there, please. Matthew 25, 31 through 40. And she signs it in Jesus, Leanne Mary. Matthew 25. Let's take a listen to what Matthew 25, 31 through 40 says. Talking about uh, the time period of the end of the tribulation and the start of the millennial kingdom. Matthew twenty five thirty one. when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered um, all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Talking about people who were um, kind to the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble. Naked and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now we know doctrinally that this is talking about um, the people, the judgment of the people on how they treated the Jewish people during the Great Tribulation. And Jesus is going to demand an accounting. If you believe the Old Testament, you know that when you get to the time of the second coming, when you get to the time of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, that it's the Jewish people that are going to be in charge. They're on the bottom now, but they're going to be on top then. Zechariah 13, 1 says, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. Now we understand that in Matthew chapter 25, and these verses have nothing to do with my sermon today, but I believe that the Lord wants me to talk about it for just a moment. And we know that when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a reckoning made. The books are going to be opened. Some of the books, the rest of the books, will be opened at the great white throne judgment. But Matthew 25 is a warning to people who find themselves in the time of Jacob's trouble. It is a warning that you better treat the Jewish people right. Because there's going to be an accounting made. And that's the basis on which the judgment of nations takes place. And the sheep and the goat judgments. It's going to be directly related to how the people of that time treated the Jews during their, their, their season of greatest tribulation. Now, what does that have to do with the judgment seat of Christ? Well, the principle is the same. Turn to Luke chapter 20, and I want to give you my text for today. In Luke chapter 20, it is the story about the resurrection. And I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. We all know the story, Luke 20, 29. There were therefore seven brethren, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second took her to wife, and he died childless, and the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and it goes on and on and on, and this one poor woman has to marry seven brothers, 
and they all die one after the other. Then the woman dies. So they ask this question of the Lord. Luke twenty thirty three. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. Then Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. And now here is my text for today. Luke twenty thirty seven and 38. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Lord, be with me. Come before you one more time and ask you for power to preach and teach this morning. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. So this morning, I want to talk to you about the fact that God is not the God of the dead. God is the God of the living. And if you die, and if you're in Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul says that we walk by faith, not by sight. The Apostle Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You know what D.L. Moody said? D.L. Moody said, while he was still alive, this is what D.L. Moody wrote. Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher, that is all, out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, amen, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the Spirit in 1856. That which is born of the flesh may die, but that which is born of the Spirit will live forever. D.L. Moody. I loved the guy. I loved his ministry. He, he, He was an inspiration to me from the moment that I got saved. And I have, 30 years later, I have... Nothing but enduring love and appreciation and respect for the ministry that God gave him. D.L. Moody had a sixth grade education. But let me tell you something. D.L. Moody was smarter than Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein did not believe the quote that I just read to you from D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was smarter than Stephen Hawking who also did not believe the things in the quote from D.L. Moody. In fact, you might say that when it comes to eternal things, when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to things that will last forever, D.L. Moody was a genius because he knew that this life was merely the training ground This life was not the be-all and the end-all. This life was simply the place where we make our decision. Are we with the Lord or are we against the Lord? Aunt Nancy said that there's lost people here this morning. I'd like to speak to you directly for just a moment. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you close your eyes in death, you will open them in a place that the Bible says burns with endless fire. 
in Luke chapter 16, it says this. Luke chapter 16, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried into the angels, uh, by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. If you're lost today, that's where you're going. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are headed for the exact same place that the rich man found himself in. But you don't have to go there. Jesus Christ went to the cross, he shed his blood, and he made your payment. You know what sends you to hell? You go to hell not because you killed somebody, not because you raped somebody, not because you committed grand larceny or slander or libel or theft or any other thing. Adolf Hitler is not in hell because of the concentration camps. Adolf Hitler is not in hell because of World War II that he started, which killed 55 million people. But that's not why Adolf Hitler is in hell. Adolf Hitler is burning in hell because he had no savior to pay for his sin. You see, it doesn't matter if you have the millions of sins of Adolf Hitler or if you only have one Sin that is not paid for. You will go to hell just like Adolf Hitler. Now, maybe his hell will be a little hotter than yours. Maybe his torture will be a little bit more intense than yours. Maybe so. But it's not going to last for a longer time. It's not your hell won't be any shorter than his hell. And people find themselves in hell because they die with no Savior. Not because they were a sinner. Everybody is a sinner. All the apostles were sinners. Judas. We read about Judas in Acts chapter 1 verse 25. The Bible says that when Judas died, and don't forget, he may have been a a murderer, he may have been a betrayer, but Judas was also an apostle. And in Acts one twenty five, it says that he may take the part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. Why is Judas in his own place and the other apostles are in heaven? Well, because Judas didn't have a savior to pay for his sin. So if you're lost today, I want to take you to Romans chapter 10 to show you how you get saved. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 8, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation for the scripture saith whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're lost today, and if you're trying to get into God's good graces by repenting of your sins, you need to stop that right now. 
repenting of your sins is only for saved people. Now, there is something that you need to repent of, absolutely. You need to repent of your disbelief that Jesus Christ is is Lord and Savior. And that's why Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you're not saved today, that's your number one problem, is that you have not confessed Jesus Christ as Savior. There's no magic prayer that goes with that. Now, In order for you to confess that Jesus Christ is Savior, then you're also confessing that you're a sinner who needs a Savior. If you're not a sinner, you don't need a Savior. Even the Virgin Mary needed a Savior. That's what the Bible tells us, that the Virgin Mary had sin. Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Even the Virgin Mary needed a Savior to pay for her sins. And if you're lost today, that's exactly what you need. You need a Savior to pay for your sins. So if you're lost, there's no magic prayer. You need to bow your head and confess to God that you are a sinner who needs a Savior. And I have already declared to you who that Savior is. If you would like it to be with a Christmas-themed message, We can do that too. In Luke chapter 2, we read this. Starting in verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Jesus Christ is the Savior. And when you confess him as Savior and you ask him to save you, well, that's exactly what Romans chapter 10 is talking about. That you are confessing not your sins, but you are confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, after you get saved, 1 John 1, nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, nine is for saved people only. If you're not saved, don't confess your sin. That is premature. Confess Jesus Christ as Savior and get saved. It's not complicated. And Romans chapter 10 shows you exactly how it's done and exactly how to do it. Now, all of these things that we're talking about the sheep and goat nations, the second coming of Jesus Christ, getting saved, all these things actually are part and parcel of my message today. So now that we've laid the foundation, now I'd like to preach to you a short message. (laughs) Um, I'd like to preach to you a short message about Omicron and the judgment seat of Christ. Headline over at the Daily Mail UK 
Six states set daily COVID records as Omicron grips nation. Variant sweeps across the United States and is now confirmed in 44 states. New York is hammered by the highest number of daily cases ever. I guess that vaccine's not working too well. Because the vaccine that people need is not mRNA. The vaccine that people need is the J-E-S-U-S vaccine. And that goes for saved people as well as lost people. On Tuesday, Joe Biden is going to address the United States of America, and he's going to do his very best to fill you with fear and to make you believe that these shots that have not stopped Omicron, that these injections that don't seem to work are the only hope that you have. Now, let me tell you something, Christian. And I want to speak very honestly and very openly and very candidly to you this morning. If you're saved today, you need to have your mind focused on the judgment seat of Christ. That's where your focus needs to be. Now, I have always said that you've got to take care of your immune system. You should be taking vitamin D3 and, and zinc and magnesium and um, omega-3 fish oil and, and all of that good stuff. You should get your rest. You should get your sleep. But you need to keep your heart and mind focused on the judgment seat of Christ because let me tell you something. Every year, 2.8 million people die around the world from alcohol-related illnesses. 2.8 million people die around the world from alcohol. In America, 450 people die every day from alcohol-related car crashes. 500,000 people die every year from heart disease. So, statistically speaking, COVID-19 in any variant is not your greatest fear, even though that they want it to be to control you. And when you allow that to happen, when you allow to have your eyes taken off the prize then you do yourself a disservice because when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to realize that you focused on the wrong thing. You're going to realize in that day that you majored in the minors. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 10 and 11 say, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men. Why is there terror at the judgment seat of Christ? Because people are unprepared. That's why. Remember when you were in school? And you forgot that a paper was due and you sat in your seat at your desk in the class and the teacher said, oh, I'm going to need those papers in right now. And everybody in the class handed in their paper and you forgot to do yours and you got no grade, zero grade, you failed the test because you weren't prepared and if you remember if that ever happened to you you remember what a terrible feeling that it was and your mind begins racing why didn't i do the paper why wasn't i prepared why what was i doing instead of this assignment And then you think back to all the things that took up your time 
instead of doing what you were there to do. Hebrews 9.27 says, as, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. For the born-again Christian, let's rightly divide Hebrews 9.27. For the born-again Christian, for the born-again Christian, the appointment that we have, something that I call the unbreakable appointment, is the judgment seat of Christ. If you're saved, you've already been judged. You've already been found guilty. And the judge has already set you free because he paid your fine. But there is a judgment coming for born-again, saved, Bible-believing Christians. And that is something that the Bible calls the judgment seat of Christ. And if you remember back when you were in school, that day that everybody handed in their paper and you had nothing to hand in, and the feeling of dread and terror that swept over you, realizing that you had failed and realizing what that omission was going to do to your grade average and realizing that you had spent your time wasting your time instead of preparing for that appointment. One of the things that we've talked about before over these last 21 months, there has been no revival worldwide. There has been no revival sweeping across America. In fact, church attendance has gone down. Everybody got all excited. Remember back in March, April, May, June of 2020? And remember all the people who were grabbing headlines, you can't shut our church down? Well, let me ask you this question. Once you get past all that junk, how come there's no revival? How come in those churches that defied the government and shook their hands and said, you can't stop us? Okay, where's the revival? Where's the headlines of the sweeping movement of the Holy Spirit? Where's the headlines of liquor stores and movie theaters closing down because people are getting saved? That's what happened in the late 1800s when D.L. Moody came to town. Liquor stores would close down. When Billy Sunday came to town, liquor stores would close down. Liquor stores tripled their business <laughs> over the last 21 months. Alcohol was declared an essential commodity something that the Bible condemns. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, uh, Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So where's the revival that all the charismatic said was coming? The last day's revival. Wouldn't you think that a global pandemic that shuts down the entire world would be the perfect catalyst for an end times revival? Don't you think that with over 5 million people dead from COVID in less than two years, you would think that that would be the perfect catalyst for an end times revival? And yet... There is no revival. The charismatics and the Pentecostals have closed down their healing lines because people really aren't getting healed. They never did, actually. But what did COVID do for the charismatics and the Pentecostals? It showed that they really don't have the power to heal people and never did. Do you realize that on some levels, COVID has been a, if, if you're a Bible believer, 
COVID has been an unbelievable blessing because it's given you the opportunity. It's given you the opportunity to find out what you really believe. <laughs> I wrote an article. Um, see if I can find it really quick. Uh, I wrote an article back at the beginning of the pandemic uh, called, Has the Government... Oh, hold on a second. It's hard to do all this and talk at the same time. Um, I wrote an article called, Has the Government Closed Your Church Down? Let's see if I can get this article to come up. I don't think I can, but... I wrote an article called, Has the Government Closed Your Church Down? And I took it from the perspective that that was a good thing. And why could that be a good thing? That's a good thing because it gives you the ability to find out what you really believe. It gives you the ability to find out how much in the game you really are and how much you're just talking. I said at the start of this message that COVID is no joke. People die from it. And I know people, I know a bunch of people who have died from COVID. So I am not taking COVID lightly. And I'm not saying that COVID is a hoax because it absolutely is not. And um, we're going to find out over the next couple of weeks just how deadly Omicron is going to be. But the good part about COVID is it now gives you the ability to find out what what you really believe. And this is what I wrote back in this article. I said, as a society, Americans in 2020 are largely a pampered lot of people, me included. True, we have our share of the poor, but not poor like what you see in Indonesia, Afghanistan, or Africa, where they lick dirt to find the nutrients. In America, there is abundance, and we are not used to living any other way. We have churches in nearly every town. And a lot of time, there are massive million-dollar mega churches. What do you see when you go inside? You see a lot of people who are going to church, but it's really more of a social club where people meet to gossip, hook up, and drink coffee. They roll their eyes if the preacher goes longer than usual lukewarm as the day is long. Maybe God is doing you a favor by allowing your church to be shut down. Maybe God is trying to wake you up. You know, um, John the Baptist, John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist, Jesus said that he was the greatest of all the prophets. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He lived out in the, in the desert. He had long hair. He wore camel skin. He ate locusts and wild honey. John the Baptist was truly an awe-inspiring, and I think on some levels, a terrifying individual. John the Baptist preached up a storm. And one day, he got to preaching, and he told Herod that he was wrong to have his brother's wife. And he told Herod to repent. 
that landed him in prison. That wound up being the last sermon that John the Baptist was ever going to give. And now we get to the meat of my message. And I really want you to pay attention. Luke chapter 7, verse 18. Luke chapter 7, verse 18. John the Baptist is in prison awaiting his execution. John the Baptist realizes that the path that he was on brought him to this moment. John the Baptist understands that he likely is not going to get out of prison and that by the time the sun comes up the next day, his head is going to be separated from his body. John the Baptist, for a very brief moment, has a crisis of faith. Luke 7, verse 18, And the disciples of John showed him all these things, and John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or should we look for another? And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. And this is the answer that Jesus sent back to his cousin through his two disciples. This was the answer that Jesus gave to his cousin. Luke seven twenty two. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. John the Baptist was brought to the end of himself and on the verge of his own execution, this is what Jesus said. Jesus could have spared him from that fate. But that's how John the Baptist was going to give glory unto God. Just like in John 21 Jesus turns to Peter and says, you're going to give God glory by dying on the cross, just like I did. Now, what does this have to do with Omicron? You might find yourself in the next week, the next month, the next six months, you might find yourself in a hospital bed gasping for breath and on the edge of dying from Omicron. That is a possibility. I have seen COVID hit all around me. My son got it. My daughter got it. Friends of mine have had it. One of my employees had it. COVID has struck all around me, like in a circle. At some point, now, I hope I don't get it, but at some point, if, if present trends don't change, everybody's going to get it because that's the plan. That's why this virus was created. That's why it had gain of function performed on it. That's why it was released from the lab in Wuhan, China to infect every single person person on the face of the earth. But I am telling you that your greatest fear is not COVID. Your greatest fear is being unprepared for the judgment seat of Christ. That should be your greatest fear. Because John the Baptist was executed Right after Jesus said, you go tell John 
The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are clean, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. And then John died like the next day. The Apostle Paul, a chosen vessel of Jesus Christ, died the same type of death that John the Baptist did. So did James, he died, Peter died. All the Old Testament prophets were killed. Maybe God wants you to go through COVID. Maybe God wants you to die from COVID. I hope not. But I'm simply trying to tell you that your greatest fear should not be COVID in any variant. Your greatest fear should be getting to the judgment seat of Jesus Christ and realizing that you have no crowns, that you have no rewards, that you have ruined your inheritance, because that is something that's going to last for all eternity. So you need to keep your eyes on what the eternal prize is. Because look, long after COVID ceases to be a problem, people die of a hundred different things every single day. And you can't possibly prepare yourself against all of those things, including seemingly random accidents and car crashes, things falling on you, accidentally drinking poison or whatever the case may be. I mean, people die from anaphylactic shock, not knowing that there was peanut butter in the fish dish that they ate and they ate the fish and then died of anaphylactic shock. You cannot prepare for how you die, but you can prepare for what happens after you die And that is the judgment seat of Christ. So, when Joe Biden gives his speech on Tuesday night, attempting to fill all Americans with fear and dread, when the Prime Minister of England puts the entire UK on lockdown this week, and that's what everybody says is coming, that they're going to go back on lockdown. And a number of nations are getting ready to go back on lockdown. I want you to begin to think and begin to pray about getting involved with things that are going to have eternal ramifications like the judgment seat of Christ. One of the things that we do here at Now the End Begins is we have our free Bible and gospel track program. And when we have our New Year's Eve um, podcast in about a week, week and a half, I'm going to let you know exactly how many free Bibles and exactly how many gospel tracks that we were able to give out in 2021. Because you support that program, and we're very, very grateful for your financial support of that program and of this ministry and and all the other things that we're trying to do here. And I, I have been working really hard to get to 15,000 King James Bibles sent out in 2021, but... It doesn't end there. We're putting up billboards all over St. Augustine. We have billboards in Louisiana and in Ocala, Florida. I want to do even more than that. Because when we do things like that, we are preparing ourselves for the judgment seat of Christ by getting something done for him. When you give a King James Bible to somebody, that is something that earns you a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. When you lead a lost soul to salvation, 
That is something that gives you a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. When you preach and teach the gospel of the grace of God, that is something that gives you a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. D.L. Moody was not afraid about dying. In fact, on some levels, D.L. Moody was looking forward to it. And I believe that that's exactly how we should be looking at it. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're sick in the hospital with COVID. And instead of things getting better, things begin to get worse. What would your attitude be? I want you to think that if you were in the hospital sick with COVID, would you be speaking to the nurses about Jesus Christ? Would you be posting things on social media to lead a lost soul to Jesus Christ? I want you to think about what would it be what would be going through your mind if you were dying of COVID right now? Because that's what Joe Biden wants you to think about. And that's what his speech on Tuesday night is going to talk about. Joe Biden on Tuesday is, wants to get you terrified about dying of COVID. But I submit to you is that is not where our fear should be. Jesus says that we are not to fear those people who can only kill the body and after that there is no more that they can do Uh, but he says but rather fear him that is able to cast both body and soul into hell and what we need this morning and I'll close with this thought what we need this morning is some good old fashioned repentance what we need this morning is getting back into our king james bible what we need this morning is to read the headlines and instead of seeing nothing but fear realize that we have been given a tremendous opportunity do you realize that the entire world is thinking about the same thing? Do you realize that in my lifetime that has never happened, where the entire world was thinking about the same thing? Do you realize what a fertile mission field that that is to see people get saved? Do you realize that you, if you have a King James Bible that you believe that you stand on, that we have the truth, not lies like QAnon, but we have the God's honest truth. And do you realize that you will never see from now until the day you die, from now until the rapture, you will never see a time period that is more fertile to share the gospel then right here and right now. Don't waste it. Don't blow it. Don't get focused on the wrong things. C.T. Studd said, only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. Why do I do this ministry seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day? Why do I do it? Well, God has called me to do it, absolutely. But why has God called me to do it? So I can be part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. So I can use the salvation that God gave me to see other people get saved. This is what we're called to do. And even if you live in a place that doesn't have a lot of people, like Caribou, Maine, Lori was telling me the other day that God gave her a great witness with some atheists. 
and she was able to hand out a couple of gospel tracts. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter if you live in New York City or you live in the wilds of New Zealand. God can use you exactly where you are. So, in closing, I I want you to prepare yourself for Biden's message on Tuesday. I want you to prepare yourself to see the world go back into lockdown. And I want you to prepare yourself to get something done for the Lord Jesus Christ that is going to last for all eternity. The ways that we do it here is we preach and teach the gospel seven days a week. We ship out Ruckman reference study Bibles. You know, they told me at the bookstore a couple of months ago that Now the End Begins purchases more Ruckman reference study Bibles than any other group or organization on the face of the earth. Do you realize that? Now the End Begins purchases more Ruckman reference Bibles than anybody anywhere in the world. And do you realize that we give out the bulk of those Bibles for free to people who need them, but they can't afford them? We also support the Bible Literature and Missionary Foundation in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Do you realize that when we started supporting them, paper was $800 for one roll, and that created 500 King James Bibles. But with the, with the um, supply chain crisis and the shipping crisis and the paper crisis, the cost of those 500 Bibles has gone up from $800 to $962. In just this year, we started supporting them in October of 2020. And here we are at the end of 2021, and the cost for one roll of paper has gone up $162. And I want to do more. Right now, we supply two rolls of paper every single month at Bible Literature and Missionary Foundation. That's $962 times two which is just about $2,000. And we do that, sometimes we do more than that. A couple of times this year, we have done three rolls of paper. But I want you to understand that we do these things because these are the things that are going to last at the judgment seat of Christ. That's why we do these things. This is why we go out into the streets and we preach the gospel. This is why I answer emails and take phone calls from people all around the world who want some counseling from the Bible, who are going through a hard time, going through a rough time. Why do we do this here at Now the End Begins? Because this is how we prepare for the judgment seat of Christ. Many times we talk about Flight 777 on Titus 213 Airlines. But today I want you to think about Flight 777 from a slightly different perspective. I want you to picture yourself sitting right there in the middle of the airplane on Flight 777 as that plane takes off. Now, of course, that's a metaphor for the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. But today, I want you to think about you sitting on flight 777. I want you to think about you taking off in that airplane, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, to meet Jesus in the clouds. Now, I want you to look around this plane. 
I want you to look around at all the seats on flight 777. And now I want you to count the number of seats that God used you to fill. How many seats would that be? I want you to think about this now. I want you to close your eyes and think of flight 777, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I want you to think about how ecstatic that you're going to be when that plane takes off. But right now, I want you to look around the, the cabin of flight 777. And I want you to count how many seats that you filled. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Brothers and sisters, the time is short. Either COVID's going to get you, (laughs) cancer's going to get you, a heart attack is going to get you, a blood clot's going to get you, the vaccine's going to get you. But either way, you're either going to die or you're going to be taken in the rapture. I invite you to help us, to join us, to hand out even more Bibles in 2022 than we did in 2021 I invite you to help us to put up more billboards than we did in 2021 I invite you to join us at now the end begins to get something done for the Lord Jesus Christ that will make it through the judgment seat of Christ help us with the Bible and gospel track program we need your prayers We need your financial support. Help us with the Gospel Billboard Witness program. We need your prayers. We need your financial support. I want you to, if you haven't bought Gospel Tracks, I want you to go to BibleBeliever.com and buy some. If you haven't um, uh, bought King James Bibles that you can hand out, Go to BibleBeliever.com and buy some Bibles. Not for you, but to give to somebody else. And when we do these things, when we do them together as the NTEB global family, when we do them as individuals, we are doing things that will make it through the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I'll say this and then I'm done. I want you to think about Flight 777. I want you to think about sitting in that plane as it takes off. I want you to look around the cabin to see how much your efforts worked to fill the seats on that plane. And if you don't see a lot of filled seats, then you come and help us at Now the End Begins. You come and help us to send out more than 15,000 Bibles next year. You come and help us to put up not five billboards, but 50 billboards. It's only money. (laughs) It's filthy lucre. Let's spend it on something that has eternal value. Let's get something done for the Lord Jesus Christ while time remains. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, God, for all these that you've gathered here today. We thank you, Father God, for revealing to us where we lack while there's still time to fix it. 
while there's still time to change it. Like the student in that illustration who is being asked to hand in their paper and they're not ready. Lord, you haven't asked us to hand in that paper yet. You may do so tomorrow. You may do so next week, next month. You may do it in 2022. You might even do it before the end of the day today. But Father God, what a blessing it is that we still have time to complete that assignment. We still have time, God, to get something done for you. And Lord, I ask you to show, reveal to me personally, God, where I can do more for you. Reveal to me personally where I can give more to you. Reveal to me personally how I can step up my game to be more of a blessing to the body of Christ and to fill just one or two more of those seats on flight 777 before it takes off. Father God, as I preach the call for revival this morning, I say, let that revival begin with me. Let it begin in my heart. Let it begin in my life. Show me the fat that I can cut out, God. Show me what offends between me and you so I can remove it. Show me, Father God, where I lack and fill me up so that I can perform service towards you, Lord. God, we don't work to get saved. We don't work to stay saved. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. But Father God, help us to shake off this Laodicean spirit that causes us to live in fear and to sit back and do nothing but try and save our own skins. That's not of you, God. Everybody in your book had no problem laying down their life for your glory. Lord, we don't qualify to be in that book other than when your book talks about sinners, well, that's us. But Father God, let us walk just a little bit in the steps of the prophets. Let us walk just a few feet in the steps of the apostles like Peter and Paul and James and John. Let us be fearless. Let us be bold. Give us a heart for lost people, God. Use us to remind the saints of the judgment seat and help us, Lord, to get something done for you that will last for all eternity. D.L. Moody said, Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher. That is all. Out of this old clay tenement into a house, John 14, that is immortal. A body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint. A body fashioned like unto his glorious body. Let this be our prayer today, Lord. Use us like you used Moody. Use us, Lord, to fill those remaining seats on flight 777. For your glory, for our good, and for our upcoming unbreakable appointment at the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll give you all the honor and the glory and the praise for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being part of this Sunday service. We have gone well over our time today, but I think it was for a very good reason. And I hope that this program um, was a blessing to you. I hope that uh, um, I was able to say something that would lead a lost soul to salvation. I hope that I was able to say something um, that would lead a saved soul to want to get on fire for God and get in the game and put Bibles in the hands of people who need them. And I'm so glad that you're with me 
I love my NTEB family across America and around the world. And uh, I am looking forward to even bigger things in 2022. Have a great afternoon, everybody. And Lord willing, we'll see you back here tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, for another edition of the Rightly Dividing King James Bible Study. Have a great afternoon. Listen to me like you've never listened to me, ever in your life. We have got to lay our lives down for the purposes of God. This is not a Sunday school picnic, the Church of Jesus Christ. This is not an invitation to have continuous good times. This is a war for the souls of men. Come out from among them. Run for your life. Because this is about your life. It's not just about an opposing theology or conflicting viewpoint on Jesus. This is about your life. My mind is forever branded with the story that I heard of police officers from the city of New York as, as people were fleeing from a crumbling building. There were police officers and firemen and others that were running towards the building saying, run for your life at their own peril. And in some cases, I believe they knew they were going to die, but there was a sense of duty. I was crying out to God. I said, God, oh, Jesus, don't let my sense of duty be less for your kingdom than these beloved firemen and policemen were for those that are perishing in a falling tower. We're living in a generation when truth is falling into the streets. I want to be among those that are not running away from the conflict, but running into the conflict and say, run for your life. Run from Gospels that focus only on success and prosperity. Run! Run from those who use the name of Christ only for his personal gain. Run from those that are picking your pocket in the name of Jesus. Run! Run from Gospels that only focus on self-improvement. Run! Run from churches where men and not Christ are glorified. Run! Run! Body of Christ, run! Get out! Don't touch the unclean thing. Run from churches in America and Canada where there is no Bible. There's no cross in the theology. There's no soul-searching word. There's no repentance from sin. There's no mention of the blood of Jesus. Run! It's unclean. Run! Run from churches where you're comfortable in your sins. If you come into the house of God and you've got sin in your life and you're not convicted of it, you're at a table of devils. Run from pulpits that are filled with political men who are using the pulpit of God for a personal political agenda. Run! Run from those who preach division between races and cultures. Run! Run! Get out! Turn it off! Get away from it! They know nothing of God. Run! from ungodly, spasmodic movements and endless, empty prophesying. Beloved church, run for your life. Run from preachers that stand and tell stories and jokes. Run like you've never run before. 